<laughs> Those of us who have been in the Fidelians for a long time have, have heard Mr. Gutierrez speak to us before. But Thomas Gutierrez serves as Dean of the International Studies and Programs and Director of the Center for Afghanistan Studies at UNO, University of Nebraska at Omaha. He also served as the Dean of International Studies and Programs at the University of Nebraska Medical Center from 87 through 2010. Prior to assuming his position in 1974, Mr. Gutierrez lived and worked for nearly 10 years in Afghanistan, serving as Peace Corps volunteer, a Fulbright Fellow, Executive Director of the Fulbright Foundation, and Head Coach of the Afghan National Basketball Team. He was also seconded by the U.S. State Department to serve as Senior Political Affairs Officer on the United Nations Peacekeeping Mission to Afghanistan from 96-97. Mr. Gutierrez speaks, reads, and writes Dari, Farsi, and Tajiki, Tajikistani, Persian. His publications include numerous articles about Afghanistan society, culture, and politics. He co-authored the two-volume language textbooks Dari for foreigners and a bibliography of Persian works in English. He also writes original Dari poetry and serves as an internationally recognized authority on Central Asia's cultures and conflicts, appearing in news articles and broadcast worldwide. It's been several years since he's spoken to our flight. Please help me welcome him back. Thanks, Jim, and uh, it's nice to uh, be back here. Not here, but uh, first time, not so it's nice to be back with you. And I, I have many friends and a lot of familiar faces here. There's, of course, one face that is not here that I know all of us must miss, and I miss tremendously, and that's Rob Hoover. And uh, I missed him particularly because no one did it better in bringing you kind of folks together with, uh, with our university. So I say that, um, and I look at Reg, and I look at you, Jim, and I look at others of you whom here I know, and, um, and I, I hope that you might help pick up that uh, fall in Lance. We have something at UNO called the Omaha World Affairs Council that some of you have attended. Reg, you've been a member in the past. Um, we like to have uh, connections with uh, you Dedalians, and, as well as the uh, Old Crows and, and others, some of you are have membership in all these things because I see you with your faces at those meetings. And we have um, events to which I know many of you have come and would like to come in, 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 as well in the future. So I'm going to uh, assign you the task of getting me your mailing list and we will let people know what what they might be able to do and then follow up with you. We'll, we'll work and you work with Vicki and we'll sure. work with you. Um, we'd, we'd like to, to, to be able to invite you. We, last year we had um, five ambassadors to talk about um, our relationships in the Middle East after the Persian, after the uh, Arab Spring. This year we had something on the Asian pivot with five other ambassadors and we, we invite people from the community to come to this. It's a free lunch that we give on campus for about two hours of panel with, you know, these ambassadors from retired U.S. ambassadors who were able to speak with, with authority about this. So we, we'd enjoy being able to uh, welcome you among those who might be able to come. It's a first come, first serve, in other words, in signing up, and uh, that's a part of the Omaha World Affairs Council thing. So I, I mentioned that to you. I mentioned one other thing here. <clears throat> before I get into my presentation, and that is this, that uh, I'd, I'd welcome the opportunity to have all of you at UNO for one of your lunches, and uh, we could have a little extended uh, program about Afghanistan or whatever it is, bringing in some of my colleagues, and, um, and we can set you up, and there are a couple of places that you can go to. So if you went, would like to do that, I mean, I know it might be difficult for you guys to drive north as far as you and all some of you, but anyhow. We do have GPS, so, <laughs> so in any case, uh, that's something that I, that I would uh, you know, be, be pleased
pleased to, 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 to have. Um, we have great, great cuisines there, and um, we'd love to have you for a lunch and do something like that. Uh, we enjoy the opportunity to have uh, folks like yourselves. You know, both my father and my uncle, uh, his brother, were members of the greatest generation, and by the looks of some of the hair on some of you, or the lack thereof, maybe you were also. But, uh, but anyhow, uh, I've always uh, had a, a high respect for people, and I think your generation was you know, really particularly dedicated, and um, uh, so I'm pleased that we have these connections. And regret, really, that with Rob's death, that, you know, it's, we, we need to be reinvigorating this, okay? So, all right, so uh, what, what I'm going to do is talk about these things that I've got up here. I, I put this together, and I actually put this together last week. So many things have happened in just a week, Ken, that uh, relating to Iraq and Syria and these uh, various offshoots of Al-Qaeda, etc., and so what I'd like to do, rather than just go through a presentation here, I will go through this, but uh, if you have a question when I'm going along, raise it, uh, and I'll cut you off when it's, when it's time for me to move on to another one. But, I th you know, you guys are, you read the news, you're informed individuals, and so you may have a question relating to some of the things. But here's my theme, my thesis here, and that is this, that in our world today, we, we, we are not fighting block against block, east against west. We know that. There's the Cold War style of war has essentially passed, you know, Vladimir Putin notwithstanding. And, uh, and so almost everything you see today in the news of a conflict or volatile nature has to do with regional issues, most of them um, our fault, our fault in that when I say our, I'm talking about Western civilization and imperialism because every border of every country around the world today has been created by the British Empire, the French Empire, the German, and whatever it is. And, and we're living with that. We also have other faults, and we'll come to some of them. I'm not saying you know, we should wear the hair shirt all the time, but I think we need to understand what the situation is. We live in a world where borders and where populations across those borders, within those borders, are always going to be, at least into the foreseeable future, problematic. And, and Al-Qaeda has morphed itself into taking advantage of that. It has been always a decentralized organization but it's now even more decentralized and it's intelligently decentralized for its own survival uh, and it's been doing that by attaching itself to problems in various regions or in various countries. Al-Qaeda looks for issues, problems around various parts of the world where it has at least a potential sway due to its narrative, which is the same narrative of Osama bin Laden and, and Zawahiri and others, uh, Anwar al-Awlaki, the New Mexican who went to live in Yemen and was killed by one of our drones. And, and they attach themselves to <coughs> these dissident groups in various countries. Best examples of that today are in Mali and in Nigeria, Boko Haram and, and et cetera, also Al-Shabaab in, in Somalia. And we're going to come to some of these here with the slides. But again, my point is that Al-Qaeda has changed, and it has changed uh, intentionally. And there are issues within Al-Qaeda now because of that, but we'll come to that too. But we're going to see this kind of thing, and it's not going to diminish. So the important thing is not whether the forces that are marching on Baghdad take Baghdad. That's of no real consequence, to be frank. I mean, it's important. It's important for that government. It, it will change things for a while. But that's not the issue. The issue is the civil war there in Iraq. That has been at the root of all of the situations there, including what's going on across the 
border now connection with Syria. We'll look at that as well. And so let me just leave you with a couple of, of, of a particular thought in terms of where we have found ourselves today. Because if you've been listening to the news, the question is, should we go in with our boots on the ground? Should we not? Should we do this? Should we do that? Should we? But what, the question is being asked, and we're searching for answers. And uh, my, my inclination is we should not put boots in the, on the ground in the midst of anybody's civil war. And, you know, that's, that's what we wisely did not do in Syria. That's what we unwisely did do in Iraq in 2003. When people write the history of our involvement in Iraq from 2003 on, there will be one phrase that will be the most famous phrase that everybody will remember from that particular event. Do you remember what it was? It was coined by Colin Powell. You break your rock, you buy your rock. That's what he told George W. Bush the night before we started. We broke Iraq, folks, and we're still paying for it today, and we will continue to pay for it into the future because of our interest in that region. It's probably one of the stupidest moves that any president has ever made in the history of our country, and, and probably illegally as well. I think you all know that, and there are, you know, auditing programs going on. When people start writing this, and, you know, it's not going to look good. And, and what we look at today in the news is in large measure due to that situation. We exacerbated, we exacerbated that thing I was just describing for you right before, you know, I, I mentioned that line. And remember this, there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq before 2003. There was none. And now it's really there, all right? And we're going to see the component parts. So I wanted, I just wanted to give you that as a, as a kind of preface to what I'm going to be getting at. So I, I have these. This isn't really large, so I hope that we'll be able to see this. But I'm going to use this as kind of my uh, uh, kind of outline here because I like to use pictures. Uh, it helps people to remember. So uh, in any case, um, you've got the theme. We're going to go through it now, all right? But before we do any of this, I'm starting with Ukraine because it has, in its own way, a similar kind of thing. Sorry, standing okay, in front okay. of here. And uh, so, you know, Ukraine here with its long border with Russia. One of the interesting things about Ukraine, of course, the Russians took Crimea. And they always say, well, this always has been Russian. Well, that's not true. It became Russian during Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great you know, was at the very end of the 18th century. And uh, that's when they took Crimea. And who did they displace there? We, we don't even know. It wasn't Ukrainians and it wasn't Russians. It was Tatars. And if you take a look at the world's maps today, you find Tatars living somewhere around here in a place called Tatarstan. And how did that get there? Well, it got there because Stalin moved all these Tatars away from here to there because he didn't trust them because they were Muslim. And they had had connections with the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Just, you know, as the Ottoman Turkish Empire used to control all this area here. This area used to be called Bessarabia, etc., etc. Here's the interesting thing about this. We know about the issues, Russia and Ukraine, and that the eastern part of Ukraine uh, it's primarily Russian, etc., and this, now this population is too. Why? Because of the social engineering under Stalin. But, even though this map shows ethnic Russian majority here, the others who are in there, minority, maybe somewhere around 20% or, or, or a little bit more, are these Tatars, who are Muslim. And believe me, this stuff is going to come back and bite Putin in the ass. Because, <laughs> because if you take a look at this map again of Europe, you know, right over here, you've got the Caucasus right north of Georgia, and you've got Dagestan, you've got Chechnya, and you've got the Ossetians. And they've got problems in Russia with these folks today, right? 
Uh, we read about explosions in subways and various different things. You know, it's not going to take much for these Tatars to make connections, and it's not going to take much for Al Qaeda to find a way to get to these dissident folks. And what kind of war will it be? It won't be a standard war. It'll be a war of terrorist attrition, right? So it'll be interesting to see. It's going to. If it doesn't occur, it means the Russians are going to have to put so much security into that region that it's not going to be a place that people are going to be moving around for, for much. And remember, this is the place so important to the Russians because this is the only place where Russia can have, now with this, a warm water port, but it can't, it can't go through here without going through NATO. So, in, in, until Global warming has its ultimate impact. Now, Russia will never have a warm water port now because the Soviet Union was moving to the Indian Ocean, through Afghanistan, maybe Pakistan. It didn't work. And now you have all these newly independent states there. So in any case, I just wanted to, I thought it was important to bring in Ukraine because this is a sectarian issue. The sectarian issue is Russians and Ukrainians having differences amongst themselves. And remember this, there were as many people who died before the Second World War due to Stalin's social engineering, moving them forcefully, and most of them from Ukraine to places they didn't want to go to within the Soviet Union. Millions of them died. And they don't forget that. So Ukrainians particularly the Ukrainian Ukrainians, the pinks and the reds here, they don't want anything to do with any of that anymore. And there are many within these areas as well. So that's going to be an interesting continuing thing. In it. But now we know this is, a, this is an ethnic linguistic situation. Russians and Ukrainians are pretty similar, and their languages are similar, but they're also different. <coughs> and, and those differences aren't going to go away. Okay, now I'm going to get to some terms and definitions here. You see the... ISIS and ISIL. Is there a difference? There is not. And ISIS is the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. But you also see ISIL. In today's paper it was ISIL. It's the same thing. It's the same organization. It's Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The Levant, of course, is Syria and Lebanon. It's the old phrase that people use for that region of the world. So, just I just thought it would be good to you know, re re review that. Sunni versus Shia. Most of you know well this particular difference. And that difference is just like Catholicism and Protestantism. It's based on church separation having to do much with, you know, succession and issues of that nature, power, power base, whatever. And, uh, but it's been going on since the Prophet Muhammad died. These folks, 15% of the world's Muslims believe uh, Muhammad should have been succeeded by blood, and these believe within the vote of the community. And then you see these phrases for Shia. This one really, really frustrates me. We don't call these guys Sunnite. I don't know why we call them Shia. And, yeah. and, and, and you know, in Arabic, it's Sunni and, and Shia. So it's the Shia, the ones who are the followers of the idea that Muhammad should have been succeeded by uh, his blood, all right? And so they are 15% of the world's Muslim population. Almost all Iranians, 63% of the Iraqis, uh, Azerbaijanis, and, uh, and, and uh, Bahrainis as well. But then most of the other Muslims in the world outside of that region, except for some percentage here or there, these individuals are Sunni. Yes? I'm wondering, did the, did the Shia dream of a caliphate, or is that just a Sunni No, that's, that's the, that, they had their own ideas of what could be a caliphate at one time, but it's not that anymore. That has always been a Sunni-oriented thing in, in Baghdad, you know. And then when, the, when that went away, it was transferred to Istanbul with the Ottoman Turks. And, that, and, and, and they didn't call him the caliph there, they called him the sultan, but that leader, the sultan, 
had both temporal and religious power or leadership. And so the Shia don't. The Shia have a more kind of decentralized thing. And, and the Shia are kind of like Protestants, you know? I mean, if you get a group of Protestants together, if you, 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 they, they, they can't stay together. They all split up into 95 different kinds of religions within a second. Well, the Shia have many, many different ones as well. So uh, they have Ismaili Shia, they have Alawi Shia, they have different kinds of ones. And Syria is a great reflection of that kind of di difference, all right? But the Shia of Iran, under the Ayatollahs, are more orthodox within Shia Islam. And to some degree, Shia Muslims are have in the past been more liberal about certain applications of Islam, and there's a there, at one time there was a lot in common between the Orthodox Shia and the Orthodox Sunni. In other words, it's kind of like Orthodox Anglicans, Episcopalians. The, you know, the Missouri Synod and Catholicism. They're all Orthodox and they all had a certain kind of establishment orientation. And so, um, but the Shia are not that. Now, that's a good lead in to the next question. All of these terms that we see, Jihadi, Islamist, Salafi, all are related to Sunnis. So all of the Al-Qaeda elements that we are, you know, introduced to. They're all Sunni. All Sunni. There are none Shia. Not at all. Because the Sunni, Salafi, Jihadi, Islamist Muslims believe Shia Islam is the number one enemy, the number one blaspheme. It's activity. So, you know, we've had similar kinds of periods in Christianity, right? We had the Hundred Years War, the Thirty Years War, we were all fighting Catholics and Protestants, etc. We thought were the Catholics thought that Protestants were blasphemous, and the Protestants thought that Catholics were whatever. So, but it's important to know these are Sunnis. Okay, 85 percent of the world's Muslim population. They have more of the money, more of the resources, more of the extent, and the largest Muslim Sunni population is in Indonesia. Uh, there are more Muslims in Indonesia than there are Arabs. And so, it, it, you know, these are just statistics you need to know. And Indonesians are really quite tolerant. And so they have had their issues of trying to keep more toleration, and, you know, tolerant behavior within, within there. The Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, often they're, they're thought of as the same because we were introduced to them in a sense with 9-11 and they were linked. But really the Taliban were created by Pakistan for its political agenda with India. And why did they want to have them active in Afghanistan? Because Pakistan to this day has this paranoia about India because it lost, as you remember, three wars with India. The British left Palestine and India in a mess each when they left. And India was partitioned and Within a matter of a year, a million people were killed as people were moving back and forth in India over this, all right? And that issues are still felt very strongly. Palestine, the same thing. Israelis and, and, and Palestinian Arabs, that, they, they, they made a mistake and, and dumped it there. Al-Qaeda, mostly these are transnational imports <laughs> where you find them in places like now, uh, Syria, Iraq, now in uh, places like Yemen, and also before in Afghanistan uh, where they were being trained. Remember, there was not an Afghan who has ever been involved in any of the attacks on the U.S. These were all Arabs who were trained in Afghanistan. They came from, you know, Libya and Persian Gulf, uh, you know, areas, okay? Okay, and then finally, here's this Ba'ath party you hear about. And this is a party that was formed by Iraqis and Syrians in opposition to British and French imperialism and knowledgeably understanding that 
their situation was being threatened by sectarianism. In other words, there's such, such diversity. Syria is the most diverse country in the Middle East. There are large numbers of Christians, as well as Shia and Sunni Muslims. And uh, so, and they've been at each other for centuries, because that's what happens in, this, in, 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 in those areas where things are contested in that way. So the Ba'ath Party was founded as a socialist, non-sectarian party to lead Iraq and Syria into the future. It was a great idea, and the concept and the philosophy behind it spot on the problem. You had your Saddam Husseins and Bashar Assad's who took the reins of those kinds of things, and, and so the Ba'ath Party and the Ba'ath philosophy became associated with autocracy. But, so now you hear in the news, you hear some Ba'athists who are together with the, uh, the group ISIS or ISIL moving on Baghdad. And who are they? Well, these are the individuals that we unfortunately, unfortunately, when we went in in 2003, disenfranchised. So we disenfranchised the whole government of Iraq. And in the process, that meant we had to rebuild the whole government of Iraq. Well, you can't do that in the space of five, six, ten years. It doesn't happen. So we left Iraq when we did whatever the reasons and the causes, etc., in, in a mess. We left it in a civil war, although we wouldn't have said so at the time. But there was a civil war going on immediately after Saddam was out. Why? Because, if we get to this here, again, the, I want, I'm going to show you this again at the end, but these are the front lines today of terror, Pakistan, Afghanistan, still with Al-Qaeda in those mountains, and we'll see that, in Yemen, in the Horn of Africa with Al-Shabaab, down here with Boko Haram, over here in Mali and Chad uh, as well, and now we have issues in Algeria and Libya, uh, where, uh, again, the, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda is trying to, you know, uh, strap on. And we've got to be concerned here. That's what Al-Sisi is concerned about. We, we moved out Mubarak. And we, what we did, you got to remember, democracy gives people a chance to express their opinion. And sometimes that expression is unfortunately volatile, or it is physical and it and that's what was going on so just like uh, our old president there George W Bush one of the sec the second or third thing that he said about one of the reasons why we're going into Iraq we want to make sure that the Christians in Iraq are going to be protected and, and have security there well there used to be over a million two hundred thousand of Christians in Iraq when we went in. There are today about 450,000, right? Why? Because what we did is we discombobulated the structure of the government and what happens? You have sectarian violence. You have newly enfranchised Shias who are attacking Christians. Now you have newly enfranchised ISIS people. They're attacking. You read in the newspaper about the Christians leaving Mosul going into an area near Kurdistan. And again, all these things, sectarian issues, you don't go into a country, into the midst of a, of a potential civil war like we did. It, 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 it just ensured we were going to have that kind of a situation. So these are the Al-Qaeda Al franchises around the world today. ISIS or ISIL, it's the same thing. There's another one, Nusra Front and al Mashrafia. They don't get along with these. So Zawahiri uh, is, is, is closer to... Uh, these groups, and he's got issues with al Baghdadi, who was the leader of ISIS. Okay, so you got Al Qaeda now, which has its own split. Then you got the things in Afghanistan relating to the Taliban and the Quetta the Haqqani network. This is where Bergdahl was cap was uh, was held prisoner by the Haqqani network. Then you got in Pakistan the Pakistani Taif Taliban. And Lashkari Taiba Taiba is, is, is its ally and, 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 and a progeny that you've got here. Al Qaeda in the Yemen and Arabian Peninsula, and Al Qaeda, Al Jazeera, which means the peninsula. 
He got El Shabaab in Somalia and Saharan Africa. He got Boko Haram. And then you've got Al Qaeda in the Islamic Mag Maghreb in Mali. And then you have in Central Asia the uh, Islamic movement of Uzbekistan and Hizbi Tahrir. In Russia, you've got Caucasus, Ossetia, Chechnya, and look to uh, Crimea and the Tatars. China, you got the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. They keep talking about an independent Uyghuristan. So we see the explosions in Beijing and Shanghai and, and Urumqi. And what are they from? What are, the, what are those people protesting or, or blowing stuff up for? These are these folks here. Then we all of our own issues here, where we have people moving in and moving around. Uh, and so they're around. So in the modern Middle East, this is the religious differences. This is what I was telling you about. These are the Shia primarily. There's about 20% of Afghanistan and about uh, a very large number of Pakistanis as well, both here and there, and some in Yemen. But most of the uh, Muslims in this part of the world, of course, the Arab world are, are Sunni. So this is just an article recently from the World Herald. I put it in here because because I want you to know that there are, people are looking at this in our local newspaper. It's a very well written article and it's informative about this this kind of split that I've just been describing. And this just looks again at that same split that I was showing you in the previous map, Shia and Sunni. This is Iraq. And this is its Shia Sunni situation. So these guys are not Arabs. They're not Semites. They're Indo Europeans like French and German and British and, Af and Afghans and Iranians. They're the Kurds. The Kurds are in uh, Iraq. They're in Turkey. They're in Syria. They're in Iran. We'll see that. Okay, they're 20% of the population of Iraq. They want to be as divorced from the rest of the Iraqis, the Arabs, as they possibly can, they have dreams ultimately of an independent Kurdistan. Okay, it may happen because of what's going on now. Okay, so this is the largest area in terms of land, but it's the smallest area in terms of population. 17% are Sunni. So in Iraq, the Sunni are in the minority, even though they're in the world's majority of Muslims, right? In Iran, the Sunni are almost not non-existent, but in Iran, I mean in Syria, these are in the majority, fighting against Bashar Assad. Okay, 63% of the population. So if you've got a democracy and people are voting blocks, then you have dictatorship of democracy. In other words, if you're voting based on sectarianism, then you disenfranchise people. This is what people are pissed about with El Maliki. This is why he is not doing a good job of stemming the tide of these forces. My God, uh, the, the Iraqi government looks like the French, uh, uh, you know, military in the, in the 20th century, you know? The, the Germans, you know, get their tanks rolling and the, and the French surrender. And so, uh, the same thing here. Uh, and, you know, they're the, they're the Shia, uh, you know, under Maliki, they're having to regroup and they're doing it by Community militia, not the military. So it's going to be interesting for us to follow. I'm just, you know, I'm not predicting anything, but I'm giving you stats that you ought to be looking at, you know, every night and in the news as we go forward, okay? Because these are the roots of the situation, all right? So now take a look at this. This is ISIS, or ISIS. This is what it now controls. Look at that. I mean, you take a look at this, it's the size of what it doesn't control. And it's bigger than, than the part of Syria that it doesn't control. And, and, and so these are Sunni Muslims, okay? These are the Sunni Muslims. These are the Kurds up here, and these are the Shia Muslims. Okay, so this is Maliki and his government. And this is Bashar Assad and his government. Now, in Syria, the Shia are in the minority. But... In the middle, you've got this new potential nugget of Sunni extremist government. And I'm telling you, it ain't going to go away. <laughs> this is not going to happen overnight. And it, think about the stabilization potential here. This is extremist Salafi 
religious nuts. And right next door to them are, is our uh, ally and is our ally, Saudi Arabia and uh, you know Jordan, both monarchies. These folks in ISIS and ISO believe that monarchies of that nature are not Islamic. They're uh, you know not appropriate uh, vehicles for rule, and therefore they believe that, you know, if they get a good foothold here, they're going to be going there somehow. And what does this mean? Well, it means that our NATO ally up here, <laughs> Turkey, our ally here, Israel, could possibly be up against physical issues <laughs> if that ISIS does happen to spread. And there's a lot of kind of local popularity in that thought because you got to remember, this whole region has always been controlled by somebody. First the Ottoman Turks, then the British and the French, and then by dictators. And they, they, they have a sense that there's a certain destiny, many people. They can, and, and, and these uh, extremist groups can play to that. Okay, so again, Iraq, Syria as it is, Iran, it's a country the size of Alaska. So it's now, as a result of our decision in 2003 to go into Iraq, what is the most, you know, uh, uh, dynamic uh, fact that emerged from that? Well, George W. Bush and, and Dick Cheney made Iran the power in the Persian Gulf. Before that, Iraq was a counter counterweight to, to that. We may not have liked them, but, you know, we didn't like them either. So... In any case, now the irony of all this is we're, we're looking for ways, it might be a good thing out of all this, to collaborate with the Iranians, not only in the nuclear issues, but remember that the Iranians are having all these Kurds here, the Kurds in Iraq, the Kurds in Syria, and the Kurds in Turkey. So, if there's a Kurdistan in Iraq, what does this do? It makes the Kurds in Iran, in Turkey, in Syria think, oh, okay, you know, let's all get together, Kurds. And there's no way. Pun, you're a little slow. Kurds in way? Okay. <laughs> what, what's going what's to happen here, quite frankly, what's going to happen here, though, is it's going to be a potentially destabilizing thing. And I, I have this map up here because, remember, <laughs> we think of NATO as Great Britain and France and our enemy Germany and our, you know, enemy Italy and, and uh, uh, who came on and became our friends. Right from the beginning, Turkey was a member of NATO. Right from the beginning, because we understood Kennan and the others. If you're going to contain Soviet Union, this is where you got to do it. So, so integral to the containment <clears throat> was Greece and Turkey. We got it, them in right early on, right? Turkey is a long-term, loyal, dedicated ally. And if they have to start putting down uprisings within Turkey, the Armenians and the Kurds and the others who get displaced there, we're going to be pissing and moaning in Congress about, you know, what are they doing to these folks? And it's going to discombobulate our relationships. Again, our interests in this region in, are not in any way served by what's happening today, which is, of course, a product of what we started to do in many ways in 2003 in Iraq. We really created a mess. Okay, the Arab Spring helped to further ignite the uh, kind of passions of the, uh, of, of the nation. So the biggest change as a result of the Arab Spring we have one country right now, Tunisia, which is looking like it's moving kind of along the way that, that the original demonstrators wanted it to. But Libya, you know, we got problems there, and Al-Qaeda's active there, Al-Qaeda's active down here across the border from Libya and Algeria and the, and the oil fields here. Uh, but what has happened, the most important development as a result of the Arab Spring is that it changed the recruiting base for Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda's membership was transnational. 
transnational. There's no nation. So they were getting Egyptians, they were getting Tunisians, they were getting Libyans, they were getting Algerians, they were getting Saudis. And all of a sudden, they're not, those potential recruits aren't concerned about the transnational connections so much as demonstrating in the streets of Egypt for the first time, maybe to have governmental change there, Tunisia, Libya, etc. And that was the major thing. So this is what helped to force Al-Qaeda to morph itself into a different kind of structure than it had before. Same narrative, same de decentralized structure generally, but kind of decentralizing even the decentralized elements, attaching itself, as I showed you in the previous map, to places where there is dissident insurgent action. Okay, so this is Bashar Assad. We're going to take a look, you know, this is where there's been most of the fighting going on. And again, this is the great Sunni area. And, uh, and so uh, this is the Shia area held by the government in Damascus and Homs and Aleppo, etc., and the, the seacoast. This is the population density. This is the lightest uh, in some ways, but also it is Sunni, this area here. And this shows you the religious sectarian diversity in Syria. Looks like a game of Chinese checkers, doesn't it? I mean, you just get any more, uh, you know, diverse looking than that. And so again, this map, that what was going on there with ISIS and ISIL, reunited with dissident groups in Iraq, and now ISIS is bigger here than it is there. And it's uniting these Salafi-minded extremist Sunni Muslims, and it is, you know, creating essentially a, uh, a, a state within, within two states. Okay, here's Turkey, our ally. So uh, these are the, this is Iraq, this is Syria, so you see how vulnerable, this is Iran, and this is where the Kurds are. So you see how, how problematic all these things are for our big ally. And here you have the Kurds in, in Turkey, and you got these other ethnic groups. They're all over here in the east, and where are all their refugees going? All over there in the east. So that destabilizes a potentially sensitive, you know, potentially volatile region even more destabilizes. So I bring that to you in terms, again, the concept of my, my, my thesis here, my theme, borders, populations, sectarian violence. Everything is being played on upon there. So now this is Africa, right? So, you know, West and Central Africa. We know what's going on here. You got Mali over here. And you've got these various groups, uh, and so here's Nigeria, I just want you to see this is the area that's being contested by Boko Haram, and we all know about this because we are trying to help the 300 kidnapped school girls. There are also 50 school boys who were kidnapped before the girls, but people pay more attention to school girls than school boys anymore, and this is a big news thing, and, and this is how we found out about what's going on in Nigeria. And so this is the ethnic, uh, or excuse me, the religious population uh, diversity in Nigeria, Christian down here, Muslim up here, uh, indigenous, which is a combination of, of many things. You have the Christian and Muslim areas as well. So you can see that it has its in, in issues. This is where the, again, the ethnic groups, the uh, up here where you have the Hausa and the Yoruba. Uh, and so a lot of these groups up here, the Hausa and the Yoruba, they're Muslim. Down here you have the, the you know, the various other groups that are, uh, you know, Nebos, etc. that are part of the Christian element. So this is where Boko Haram is active, in the Muslim area. These are the colors and the numbers of attacks that have been attributed to Boko Haram since July of 2009. This means, you know, as many as 500. This is between 200 and 500. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of attacking going on in, in Africa's largest country in terms of population. 
All right, now I'm going to go quickly to you know, my favorite area, Afghanistan, and um, which used to be the crossroads of Asia. Everybody was moving just like they still do in the Gobi Desert. Uh, these, this blue lapis lazuli and turquoise from Iran, blue lapis lazuli covered the face of King Tut, which shows you how much the silk and spice roads were at the heart of everything. You know where all of the depots and all of the villages and the settlements along the silk and spike roads, spice roads, why they were, what people were trying to, to go after? What was the most important thing there? Water. Water was the second most. Who's, I think I heard it over here. Spice. Close. It's salt. Salt. It was the most valuable commodity on the ancient silk and spice roads. Why? Because we didn't have refrigerate, re re refrigeration. Pepper, cumin, sugar, they're all uh, preservatives as well. And then when things are no longer preserved well anymore because they're getting old, then you just use those same spices and you boil the living daylights out of it or you cook the living daylights out of it and you make it taste good as well and so it's safe. Okay, this is, this is what you know, Alexander was after. He was after all the depots on the silk and spice roads. He's going all across the borders. The greatest military commander in history. I mean, you can, you can tell me anybody. And nobody can beat him. He went from here with a group, and every night he had to take care of 14,000 people, feed them, and, 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 and keep them peaceful. And he did that for the rest of his life until he died in 32, at the age of 32. He conquered Egypt, and he set up the dynasty that would produce its final last pharaoh of Cleopatra. He went into what is today Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, in down the Indus. He had all that area, the primary area of the, of the world at the time, the silk and spice roads. Huh? And he did that by the time he was 32. It's just amazing. So none of us here have any hopes. <laughs> all right, this is how he got around. And anyhow, so just to put it in context. All right, Afghanistan today. I'll, I'll take a question on the elections if you want. I, I don't want to go into that. Here's the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. This is the area where all the insurgents are. This is what Hamid Karzai kept telling our governments. You know, guys, you're attacking us, but the terrorists are over here. You know, have any of you heard of Carlotta Gall? G-A-L-L. G -A -L -L. She's a great journalist. She's just written a fabulous book. It's called The Wrong Enemy. She also wrote an article taken from that book, what the Pakistanis knew about Osama bin Laden. Well, they knew about There's no way. If any of you have spent any time in a society like Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, everybody knows everything in one's neighborhood. There's just no way that somebody didn't know about what was going on. And, of course, the Afghans kept saying to us, you know, Osama bin Laden's over here. He's not here. He's not here. Osama bin Laden somewhere here or down in Karachi. Kept saying that, kept saying that. We kept attacking people, wedding parties in Afghanistan. But here's where the people are. Where's the Haqqani group? Well, they're right here, attacking in here. Where's the Hikmatyar group? Well, it's right here, attacking in here. Where's, the, you know, where's Mullah Muhammad Omar? Well, he's down here in Quetta or Karachi, and he's right here. This is the Taliban originally of Afghanistan, the Quetta Shura. And they're here attacking that way. All right. That discombobulates. So Pakistan, relating to any question you ask me relating to Afghanistan, is the 20-ton gorilla in the room. Because if it doesn't control these groups in the tribal areas, they're going to continue to do it there. In the meantime, there's only four districts out of 350 in Afghanistan that the Taliban have any control over. So all the violence you hear about in Afghanistan is through IEDs and uh, you know suicide bombers and truck bombs and things of this nature. That's Timothy McVeigh kind of warfare. One guy like that can, you know, we didn't know who did it when he did Oklahoma City. Everybody was wondering, we all believed it was the Muslims or somebody like this, etc. until we found out he was one disaffected American citizen. But he took out a city in a sense because of what that intimidation and concern creates. 
And that's what's going on with these people across the war, I mean across the border here, uh, you know, between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And how is that made possible? Well, we just go back quickly to this map here. You've got light Kurds blending over the borders. You've got Pashtuns blending over the borders. No member of the Taliban in Afghanistan, remember what I said? No member of Al-Qaeda and the uh, extremist Salafi, Islamist, Jihadi, Muslims is a Shia. They're all Sunni. No member of the Taliban is not a Pashtun. Well, it's because they have access going across the border to between these two countries, as I showed you there. All right, so here's Pakistan. I'm just going to, you know, go through that. We know about Pakistan mostly in the United States because of this girl, right? She brought to our attention, just like uh, Benazir Bhutto's uh, assassination did, about things going on, and then there's an explosion there, etc. But this country has real issues. It's 180 million strong, and it's at war within itself as well. There are all those Muslims who left India to go to Pakistan after partition. They have not been incorporated into their society. They're living in one of the world's largest cities, Karachi. Karachi, I'll tell you, don't go there. It's the greatest potential place for random violence in the world today. And it has a lot to do with that. And so where are those Taliban who are fighting in Afghanistan coming from? They're not Afghans from the, the area in Afghanistan. They're coming from Pakistan. I've seen them when I was working, as mentioned by Jim here, in 1996-97 for the UN and the US. I saw convoys of Taliban going in and fighting inside Afghanistan. They couldn't speak Dari or Pashto. They were speaking Urdu or Arabic. They were being transported. They were being exported into Afghanistan to fight. Okay, this is that border again. It's, it's the same distance from Boston to Omaha. So we had 5,000 troops trying to hold it right after 9-11 not a wise military choice. I include India only because here's a country, the world's largest democracy, the world's largest middle class, but there's not a day in India in which there isn't an article about some individual dying due, due to some kind of sectarian violence over predominantly religion. Whether it's Muslim or Hindu, sometimes Sikh, or Hindu, you have an attack on a mosque, you have an attack on a temple, you have an attack in some way or another. So it's a potential kind of boiler, boiling spot as well. And it's been in the news because this guy here, uh, who, by the way, has been a noted, uh, you know, sectarian-oriented Hindu nationalist leader. And he's playing on the majority, and he got elected. It'll be very interesting to see whether or not he can, you know, keep from uh, playing on that kind of stuff. So this is, the, you know, India's religions. You got Hinduism, 80 percent. You got Islam. There are more Muslims in India than in Pakistan. You got uh, plus there are more than there are Arabs. Uh, then you got Christians, 2.3 percent. They're having issues in both Pakistan and India because of sectarian violence. You got Sikhs, about 2%. So where's next? Well, I've mentioned it before. Uyghurs and Uyghuristan. So this area up here, when there's bombings here, it comes from here. When there's bombings here, it's coming from here. The Uyghurs, they want an independent... Remember, the Chinese Han lives here. When the Chinese in Shanghai talk about the West, they're talking about Xi'an. It's like the New Yorker who thinks anything beyond the Hudson River is the far West. <laughs> well, these people feel that, the Tibetans and all of the other ethnic groups on the Uyghurs. They don't feel a part of Han China. And so, you know, it's an, it's, it's an issue. And how are the Chinese going to do with their new Han wealth? and the aspirations of people for more participation, more civil society. These are, these are all 
under the, the, the surface for the most part. Okay, so that's where, I, that's where I'll leave you, and, and I don't know, I usually don't wind up letting people have any time because uh, I, I, I have things I want to say. So if you have one question, if you had any other questions, I'll be glad to try and, and answer it. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. We want to... So that we can go to, uh, to UNO for some of these presentations he was talking about. And we'll keep you informed on that. Uh, but we want reserve parking. <laughs> we will get it for you. All right? In the aviation department? No. no, no actually, we do do that. Uh, we, yeah, we generally hold these things at the Scott Conference Hall, and there's great parking right oh, across oh, the street. down on the South Campus. Yeah, right. Play, no. But okay. even if we don't, we hold it at the Alumni House, and then that also has good parking. Yeah. I've got our Order of Dedalians commemorative coin I'd like to present to, uh, to you. you today. And what are you going to do? I'm going to keep in contact with your secretary. Yes. And what are you going to send her? I'm going to send her a, uh, a list, of, list, of, list of members. <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to let them know about OWAC, each of them, and it's no. their choice. Exactly. We're not going to be in the All right. I'm surprised that he is the dictator. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> one of the lights remaining. So, so thank, thank you all. Nice to be here. Really.